Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the latest installment of the Chancellor's Colloquium Distinguished Speaker Series. Now, it need, in its uh, sixth year, the uh, Colloquium Series continues the work of inviting scholars, academic leaders, and policymakers to our campus, who encourage us to take a fresh look at the university as an incubator for ideas and a force for change. Through discussions of the future of the humanities, the role of the research university in an interconnected world, and the challenges facing scientific research in our current economic climate, among other, of course, critical issues, this series provides a vision for the future of our university. So we're so fortunate to have with us this afternoon Dana Salela, a professor of political science and the president of the University of Miami since 2001. During her tenure, the University of Miami has solidified its position among the top U.S. research universities, boasting a capital campaign that raised $1.4 billion in private support for the university's endowment, academic and research programs and facilities. Our format this evening, and of course it follows the same format that we have established for the for a number of uh, lectures in this series, we'll begin with opening remarks by President Salela entitled, The New Global Health Challenges, Non-Communicable Diseases, followed by a discussion with our moderator, Dr. Julie Frislag, our Vice Chancellor for Human Health Sciences and Dean of the UC Davis School of Medicine. Then the audience will be given an opportunity to ask their own questions of President Salela. Let me first introduce our moderator, Dr. Julie Frislag, and then I will introduce our speaker. For more than 15 years, Julie has led education and training programs at top medical schools in the country in her role as a faculty member and chair of surgery and vascular surgery departments. Her national leadership includes serving as a former governor and secretary of the Board of Governors and a region and present chair of the Board of Regents of the American College of Surgeons. She is the current president of the Society for Vascular Surgery and a past president of the Association of VA Surgeons and the Society of Surgical Chairs. Julie is the editor of JAMA Surgery and a member of the editorial boards of the Annals of Vascular Surgery, Journal of the American College of Surgeons, and British Journal of Surgery. She has published more than 200 manuscripts, abstracts, and book chapters, primarily addressing the treatment of abdominal aortic aneurysms, carotid artery disease, and peripheral vascular disease, utilizing outcome data and clinical trials. I'm now honored to introduce our distinguished guest, President Dana Salela. As U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services under President Clinton, she managed a budget of nearly six billion, 600 billion, which included, I missed a few zeros, <laughs> which included a wide variety of programs such as Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Child Care and Head Start, Welfare, the Public Health Service, the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Food and Drug Administration. Born in Cleveland, Ohio, President Salela received a degree in history from Western College for Women. One of the country's first Peace Corps volunteers, she served in Iran from 1962 to 1964. She earned a PhD from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. President Salela has more than four dozen honorary degrees and a host of other honors. My provost and I were wondering how many commencement ceremonies she has participated <laughs> in. Among those many honors, she, has in, she was inducted in 2011 into the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls, New York. She has been elected to the Council of Foreign Relations the National Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Political and Social Science, and the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. In 2008, 
President Bush presented her with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award. Thank you so much for being with us, President Salela. I will turn the podium over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Madam Chancellor. Um, if it was six billion, you would have left out Social Security and Medicare, and I don't think this crowd would have liked that very much. <laughs> um, thank you for that very nice uh, uh, introduction. I'm I'm delighted to be here. I I don't accept many invitations, but if I'm on the road and uh, I can fit one in for a colleague, I'm always uh, uh, happy to do it. Uh, I noticed that Laura Tyson's name was up there. She's much smarter than I am. She was a wonderful colleague of mine uh, in the uh, Clinton administration. And speaking of the Clinton administration, as many of you know, I'm stepping down from the University of Miami to become the CEO and president of the Clinton Foundation um, if Mrs. Clinton decides to run, which apparently she's going to tell us on Sunday. If she doesn't, I'm going to have a nice long vacation <laughs> and a leave of absence. Um, before I begin, um, I uh, want to say something about research universities because this is an extraordinary one and they have very special places in my heart. Before I went into government, I was chancellor of the University of Wisconsin at Madison, one of the great research universities in this country. Before that, actually, I was president of Hunter College. I was a very young college president, didn't know what I was doing. In fact, I like to say that this presidency, this is the first time in my career in a job in which the consensus was I was qualified. All the others I sort of overreached. But um, the American research universities, people are always asking us, are the Chinese catching up with us? Uh, what about the Indians? The answer is no, they're not, because we have this array of extraordinary research universities. Uh, I, I like to tell the story about when I went to Japan and I was visiting one of the great um, gardens. It was actually the foreign minister's garden. And I looked at that garden and I said, to the foreign minister, gee, can I borrow your gardener to take back to Wisconsin? And he said, to get a garden this beautiful, it will take uh, my gardener and 50 years. And that essentially is the story of the great research universities. There are places that have to be nurtured, and we're going to go through a period in which they're quite, quite fragile. I hope the debate in the presidential campaign is also about our investments in biomedical, in the biomedical sciences in NIH and NSF uh, in particular, because they are in fact the underpinning um, for the economic health of this country. And I, I actually see the relationship between the great research universities, what you're doing here at Davis, uh, and in the UC system, and our future for our children and the future of this country economically. And we've got to see that link, and we've got to protect, even with all the craziness uh, of uh, universities in this country, um, and my institution is no exception. In fact, my style of management, I say to people, um, you know, at this moment, someone at the University of Miami is doing something stupid that I'm going to have to straighten out next week. <laughs> so I'm just pretty, which is why I can go run the Clinton Foundation. I'm very unflappable about these uh, kinds of things. <laughs> and so I wanted to make that point uh, about research universities because I think it's important um, and I accept uh, only a handful of invitations, but I think that I, I always want to say to uh, voters in particular that what you're voting for is really the future of the country and that these, that our great research universities in this country are at the centerpiece uh, of that future in my judgment. Um, you know, the, the world's attention is focused on Ebola and these um, infectious diseases that we all know about. And we go through these exercises periodically uh, about, uh, and they're very serious diseases. They're the result of globalization. They're very difficult to contain uh, because people are moving very quickly because they're getting on airplanes and, and they're passing foodstuffs uh, all over the world. Um, but the biggest health threats, and I've just finished a a session on a panel for the Council on Foreign Relations on exactly the subject I want to talk about. The biggest health threats uh, in the developing world in low and middle income countries are not the infectious diseases, but in fact are the chronic diseases that we all know something about. 
Um, there are conditions that uh, we usually talk about in more affluent countries. That's a fresh idea. We're talking about cardiovascular diseases and cancer and diabetes um, and other uh, non-communicable diseases um, that we all know about. The leading killers in the developing world are these diseases, not the infectious diseases that we think about, but the non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular and cancer. But the interesting thing about them is not just that they killed 8 million people last year, but they killed them before they were 60 years old. So the pattern is not one of the things that all of us have to learn, and I'm a social scientist, is that you can't just translate our experience in this country with our experience in other parts of the world. In fact, those diseases are killing people younger in the developing world than they are in the developed world. And the reasons for that, uh, some of which are, uh, are obvious. Um, the economic costs are enormous for those diseases and for those countries because, again, we're talking about their workforce and the impact of non-communicable diseases on the workforce and, therefore, on the economies of, um, of the developing uh, uh, countries. Um, and so, as we focus on global health, um, this country has no dedicated programs of any significance. We've got some small programs at the CDC, at the State Department, and USAID that are dedicated um, to um, the non-communicable diseases. The UN, the World Health Organization, have written reports on them. They've had meetings on them, but we don't have a lot of discussion. So today I'd just like to make three or four points, and then Julie and I are going to have a conversation, I think, about a wide ranging of it issues. Um, first, that non-communicable diseases are rising faster, they're affecting younger populations, and they have worse outcomes in the developing countries. Uh, not just the result of higher incomes or declining infection rates. The increase in life expectancy um, in the developing world is a result of good things that we've done children's health, breastfeeding, hand washing, um, and of course safe immunizations that we've been very effective uh, at. Why then are people getting uh, non-communicable diseases uh, earlier? I think mainly because life expectancies have improved in those countries without improvements in their health systems. And that is, we focused our attention on eliminating specific diseases, on vaccinations, on uh, um, children's and women's health, but we have not focused our attention on the infrastructure, the healthcare infrastructure that we need to. There, and we have no real um, uh, infrastructure uh, to prevent. Uh, diseases, um, non-communicable diseases, stuff that we already know how to do, or to manage chronic care, things that we, we've begun to learn uh, in this country in particular. More importantly, most medicines are purchased out of pocket in these countries, even though there are low-cost vaccines as well as treatments, uh, uh, vaccines for childhood diseases, and uh, treatments, of course, for AIDS through PEPFAR, we've done a magnificent job around the world with a lot more uh, left to do. We have not taken care of the kind of routine things that would help us to manage chronic diseases in many of these countries. And so most uh, medicines are purchased out of pocket. Their quality is uneven uh, in these countries. Health spending has tripled in all of these countries in the developing world. Uh, but not uh, uh, like uh, the increase in spending in uh, the developed world. Globalization has led to things like processed foods, uh, to less fruits and vegetables. Think of that, that in the developing world, um, much like the poverty areas in the United States, what globalization has done is brought in processed food and reduced access to fruits and vegetables in much of the rest of the world. Tobacco has had a huge impact. As we have pushed tobacco out of this country, 
and reduced the number of children that are smoking in this country and created smoke-free campuses um, and, and smoke-free buildings all over this country, the tobacco industry has shifted its focus on the developing world. And therefore, the increase in tobacco use by women and by children all over the world is having this kind of impact on uh, uh, chronic diseases. Dietary diversity has actually declined in the developed world, which means people have less access to the primary foods that they used to have. And, uh, and there's a lack of consumer protections. There's no FDA. Um, there are no local standards on food safety. So all of these things in combination, uh, there's no labeling in much of the developing world to tell you what you're, what you're eating or what you're taking in. And so the infrastructure of food safety, of drug safety, uh, along with the fact um, that there's not easy access to safe drugs or to chronic care or to a health care infrastructure um, is creating um, literally a monster for the developing world as they see larger and larger of younger populations dying at an earlier age from things like stroke, uh, all sorts of cardiovascular issues, cancer, diabetes um, in many of these countries. The creation of slums. Urbanization is very different in the United States than it is in the rest of the world. I spent much of my graduate uh, years because, hanging out with the anthropologists because they were studying interesting things like the barriadas in Peru. Uh, those, um, the urbanization in Africa, in Asia, and uh, in Latin America uh, resulted in slums, in less access to safe food and water. Uh, and less access to medicine and healthcare infrastructure. And that also has caused earlier death in many of these uh, major uh, diseases. Tobacco has been a particular problem. If we could deal with the tobacco issue in the developing world, we could have a major impact. Some countries have. Mexico has reduced substantially uh, the use of tobacco by young children and by women uh, in that country, often with taxes. Poor people are very sensitive to price. And if you add taxes to things like tobacco, you actually reduce the number of people, particularly the number of people like children, that you don't want to have access uh, to these kinds of things. So there are all sorts of things that you could do with taxes. I remember um, one of the senior health people in China saying to me when I was secretary, uh, could you please have your finance minister talk to my finance minister? because he's making so much money from tobacco that I just can't get through that this is a major health hazard. So I actually got Bob Rubin, the Secretary of the Treasury, who knew nothing about tobacco. Or, um, I briefed him up and got him to talk to the finance minister of China, and we actually got some movement in terms of tobacco prevention. But China is still a center uh, for smoking. What really happened is that we pushed it out and the tobacco companies found new markets. They found new markets all over the world, and that's creating much uh, of the issue. But when you think about it, when you think about these premature deaths, you think about the strategies that we've had, even some of the strategies that we've had in this country. We jerry-build immunization systems. Um, I love telling the story of, uh, well, let me talk a little about a presidential campaign. Um, when this campaign starts, and some of the candidates are already in, some college dropout is going to be assigned to each of these candidates. And that kid with a handheld device is going to write down every promise that that candidate makes. And if they get elected president, they'll put together a book called Promises, Promises. Um, it's described by cabinet officers that way. And then they'll kind of rip it apart, and um, the president will call in each of his cabinet officers and hand them a list of the promises. And you look at that list and you think, Oh, God, he didn't say that, did he? Um, but basically, that book will be put together for the next president of the United States. On Clinton's list was immunizing every kid in the United States. Uh, U.S. immunization rates by three, which is when you're supposed to get most of your shots. Most of our kids were getting their shots by the time they were starting school in the first grade, but they needed to get them earlier. And uh, President Clinton was absolutely committed. He said, it's one of the few things that we can get done. So he called me and he said, get all the kids in the country immunized. 
And um, our immunization rates were lower than any country in uh, the Western Hemisphere except for Haiti. That's how low our rates were. They were about just over 50 percent of getting the kids their shots before they were three years old. So I called all of the leaders of public health in the Department of Health and Human Services into a room but much like this one and said, our first assignment is to get all the kids uh, immunized. And every single one of them stood up and explained to me why we couldn't get all the kids immunized. We didn't have a health infrastructure. We didn't have universal health care. The parents didn't know um, the names of some of these diseases we were immunizing against. They were very expensive uh, for, to have them pay for these shots. Uh, they have to go to a public health service to get the shots uh, free. The pediatricians actually weren't taking responsibility for giving the shots. They didn't, uh, they weren't keep keeping the vaccines. Oh, boy, did I get the excuses from everybody. Um, so I reached into my purse and I pulled out a postcard that my golden retriever, Bucky, had just gotten from his vet. <laughs> and the postcard said, Dear Bucky, time to come in for your next shot. <laughs> And I waved it at the crowd, and I said, look, if we can get all the golden retrievers and the cows and the sheep, you'll appreciate that at Davis. If you can get all of these things immunized, we can get all the kids in the country immunized. So we jerry-built a tracking system. Um, we got the, uh, the Congress to pass a bill uh, discounting, tremendously discounting the vaccines. We passed them out to pediatricians. The American College of Pediatrics helped. I got every government department to work on it. And I even remember when the Gerber's people came in to see me about something else, I got them to put the, the vaccine schedule on the back of the Gerber's boxes. I got McDonald's to put it on the tray liners. And we actually built a system without a universal health care system. That's also the problem in the developing world. The problem is we eventually have worked out a system so that we can get all our kids immunized. At the end of the first term, we had 90% of the kids uh, were immunized. The other 10%, we probably weren't counting, but 90% was about 100%. Well, we had that 1% out in Idaho that um, thought they didn't have to immunize their kids, mostly upper <laughs> class people. But, but we basically got the kid immunized, and we got tracking systems uh, put in place to get the kids immunized. The problem with that is it's ad hoc. In, in the developing world, they've done a pretty good job uh, getting kids. UNICEF has done a magnificent job, the World Health Organization. We figured out how to do that. We don't have a system for the chronic diseases. We don't have a system for cancer. And in much of the developing world, something like cancer is centralized in their major city. I remember working with the health minister of, uh, of Egypt, and we came up with this really neat scheme. Only someone that knew higher education could figure this one out. We wanted to get cancer treatment outside of Cairo so that the families didn't all have to come in. And so we decided, he and I thought this up at a World Health meeting, that he'd put regional centers out. But the question was, how could he get his cancer people out there? Well, what he did was he doubled the pay of the young oncologists and talked them into going out, paid them a tremendous amount of money, and then talked the senior people into doing rotations out in the regional areas. But when he got out there, they had to build full clinics because it wasn't just cancer. For people that have cancer, they need all sorts of things in addition to that. And so they actually had to build a health system, a regional health system, uh, to deal with all of that, and schools for the kids of uh, the physicians and the nurses that were going to go out to the regions and not live in, in Cairo. So that infrastructure had to be uh, put together. Um, we need to lead on this issue uh, around the world. Global health is actually in transition. It's no longer the exotic parasites or the bacterial blights or the communicable diseases which have dominated the headlines in our interest. Um, the, health priorities, the health priorities that have to be rethought are important, uh, but um, uh, the interest of uh, the rest of the world uh, is, has always been focused on emergencies. We've addressed AIDS and malaria and poor ro ro reproductive and maternal health. Um, all of those things support workers and help in the economies of those countries. And my argument is that chronic diseases are precisely the same. And we've got to turn some of our 
attention to building health systems, to allocating scarce resources, uh, to enforcing public health laws and consumer protections. But these are decisions for the countries themselves. I would not be calling for other than us helping uh, places to organize in terms of their pro priorities and providing technical assistance. Many of these national governments um, have to rethink the kind of health infrastructure beyond simply setting up a primary care clinic um, in, uh, in a region. We've got to review our own priorities. Now, what am I really talking about? If you look at cardiovascular deaths alone, 13 million. Uh, we cut mortality in this country for cardiovascular uh, deaths by 40%. Um, we've got declines in smoking and hypertension. Um, there are lots of off-patent uh, medications now. Um, the use of aspirin and beta blockers and AC inhibitors, I mean, all of these things are relatively low cost now, but they have to be organized. Taxes work for tobacco. Taxation and surveillance are things that many of these countries could put in place. For cancer, for liver cancer, the HPV vaccine, for cervical cancer, a combination of screening and the HPV uh, vaccine. So my point today is that as we're focused on things like Ebola, we better be focused on something larger because our markets out there will demand that we help the rest of the world focus on a set of diseases that we've had here for a long time that we struggle to manage as chronic diseases, but are really showing their face in much of the rest of the world, in large part because of our successes, but in large part because of the poverty and the lack of infrastructure in many of those countries. This is the new work to be done in global health. Um, and I also think it's the new challenge uh, for the new president, as the new president, uh, whomever uh, he or she is, um, comes into office. Thank you very much. Well, that was fantastic. Have you turned me on? Can you hear me? I heard you're always turned on. <laughs> They, but surgeons, surgeons, you know, occasionally surgeons. they mute me. Now I think they <laughs> unmuted me, right, to do it. And, and it's, it's Donna on as well, too, so we can hear yeah, her. Yeah, fine. What a great talk uh, to discuss what's going on uh, in global health. We've seen that as a surgeon where it used to be all infectious disease, and then all of a sudden they needed surgeons because there were operations that needed to be done. And, mm -hmm. and similar, if you needed your hernia fixed, you had to buy your mesh and buy your antibiotic and show up, and the surgeon was sort of free. Can we utilize any of the infrastructure we put in place for HIV or research uh, to help, to be the helpers to show up? We certainly can build out, because one of the things we know about HIV is that most people don't die from AIDS. They die from the other infections that are associated with it. So I think that uh, we certainly can build that out, that kind of infrastructure out. Um, the immunization um, is more of a one-shot, of course, but... Um, we have trained workers that can, that can now turn to managing chronic diseases, but we've got to get all the pieces in place. I think that sometimes we think that the health infrastructure is simply setting up a hospital or a clinic and getting the workers when, um, when you think about it, we've made the best strides in health in this country with all due respect to the surgeons and the specialists with clean water, clean air, immunizations, um, building codes. When you look at the big jumps that have extended life, it's been the low tech, not necessarily the high tech um, uh, stuff. So th that one of the things the World Health Organization has is they have some best buys. That is, what are the things you can do, like tobacco control, that'll get you the biggest bang for the buck? And of course, as you well know, um, in surgery and in other specialties, with handheld devices, we can do all sorts of things. We're going to be able to do MRIs with our handheld uh, devices. That's going to put a lot of people out of, uh, out of business. But we're going to be able to do a lot of things. Everybody has a cell phone in the rest of the world. We're going to be able to do a lot of things. Um, and if you watch some of the NGOs that are doing work, and I've been watching the Clinton people, of course, in the Clinton Global Initiative, they're inventing all sorts of things. Even clean camp stoves, which the government of the United States has worked on for a long time 
is, a, is another way, upper respiratory diseases and, and other kinds of things. So cheaper ways of delivering high quality uh, health care, I think, um, but getting better outcomes as a result. Because no matter what we do, we need lots of healthy people. And then when you do get sick, then you have to have the high tech to do that. Yeah. So immunization. So I have a granddaughter at Berkeley. She's seven months old, and my daughter-in-law told me she will not use the health, the daycare in Berkeley because the immunization rate is uh, 20% Ooh. in that daycare. Uh, a lot of smart people in Berkeley, I'm told, um, <laughs> to do it. Yeah, it's been uh, upperclassmen. You know, the we sort of are a byproduct of Berkeley's yeah. exit. You yeah, that, you know, too. the... Um, I went out with the governor of Idaho, who's very conservative, and we debated all over the state. He's very much for immunizations. And he and I went around the state uh, to convince people in that state that they had to do immunizations. This movement against immunizations is dangerous, and it's stupid, and it's anti-science, and um, we really um, should not be putting up with it. Absolutely. We had that scare, as you know, in Disneyland. Yes. That actually, I think, did turn some heads to do it. So let's turn to your next job, which I heard a, a lot of people go, oh, really, to do that? You're, what, what made you decide, yes, that is what you want to do, and what do you hope to accomplish, and what should we watch you do with you know, that foundation? At this, at this, I don't know very much about the foundation. I want you to know I sort of t t it sounded like a good idea, and I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever says no to Bill Clinton, I mean, he, he talked me into leaving Wisconsin. I loved Wisconsin, and he talked me into going to Washington and giving up uh, my beloved Wisconsin Badgers. Um, he, um, uh, all of this is predicated on whether Mrs. Clinton's going to run, obviously, because they're going to get themselves occupied. It's a very interesting foundation. It does lots of interesting things. But mostly it came up with, a, with a, what I think is a new idea, and that is getting the private sector, major multinationals, major companies, working with NGOs. We've always had these public-private partnerships, but we've never had large corporations and businesses um, developing new products, new delivery systems, getting things done in areas where government can't be as nimble. Excellent. Um, I had a question for you as a, as a leader. Uh, you say you're unflappable. Um, do you have to be born that way? Or can, <laughs> can, you, be de can you develop being unflappable? And, and how do you take jobs that, as you said, you weren't qualified for, yeah, just, um, except for the last one, I guess? Yeah. You, so define unflappable, and how do you develop your I just, unflappable? I, I just, uh, you're taught it. I mean, you learn it over a long period of time. I remember uh, Madeleine Albright and I think Sandy Berger were going out to defend the Clinton foreign aid policy at Ohio State, and I said to them, don't do it. You guys are so inexperienced. Madeleine said, I've been teaching for years. I said, Madeleine, you've never had a bunch of lefties in your face. You go to a college campus, you better be ready um, uh, to take on um, and to, uh, to deal with that. I think a lot of it's experience. Um, and a lot of it's people coaching you over the years. I don't think people are born leaders. I think over a period of time, particularly if they're good learners, um, we're doing a cultural change initiative at the University of Miami with the Disney people, actually. And um, they said, what's the first thing you'll tell the new president? And I said, shut up and listen. <laughs> because essentially, great leaders learn how to listen. My first job... Well, I had a lot of jobs before that, but uh, my first college presidency, I was in my 30s. I, it was Hunter College in New York. Maybe there's some New Yorkers around here. One of the great public institutions, originally a women's college. Four Nobel laureates uh, went there. And um, uh, I had only been a department chair. I mean, I didn't do the dean provost business, but they had a big mess over the search, and I was coming out of government. I was tenured at Columbia. I was coming out of government, and um, they offered me the job. I walked in there, and I was scared to death because I had never run it. Uh, they had 24,000 students. It was not a small little institution. It was on, at Park Avenue and 69th Street. So I walked in, I figured, like a good social scientist, I did survey research. This is what a lesson in, in listening. Um, and, and so what did the survey tell me? that it was a survey of faculty, staff, and students. They all said the same thing. They wanted the buildings to be clean and safe. No one said, I need more lab space, I need a faculty office. They wanted the buildings to be clean and safe. Well, 
you didn't need an academic to get buildings clean and safe. <laughs> I got the buildings clean and safe, and I had enormous credibility. <laughs> enormous credibility. But also is a lesson in learning, in, in listening. My first lesson in learning and listening was as a Peace Corps volunteer. When I graduated from college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was kind of a flake, actually. I know it's hard for you to believe, but I was a flake. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I applied to graduate school, got into all these places, applied to the Peace Corps, got into the Peace Corps. I, I laid out all these options at my desk, and I thought, ah, the great adventure would be the Peace Corps. So this was the 60s. I went off to the Peace Corps. Uh, over the objections of my family, except for my grandmother, my family is Lebanese, you know, the other side of the Mediterranean. My grandmother said, she's going to the old country, no problem. She's going to Iran. <laughs> so as I was leaving the house, my grandmother gave me this letter. And she said, give it to the head man of the village when you get there. I didn't even know whether I was going to be in a village. But I tucked the letter in my pocket. And by golly, there I was in a mud village in southern Iran. And so the letter said, this is it, it, in classical Arabic, only my grandmother was very well educated. It said, this is to introduce Donna Shalala, the daughter of a great sheikh in Cleveland, Ohio. Please put her <laughs> under your protection. Well, he did. And we were supposed to do a number of things. We were building an agricultural college, actually, in southern Iran. And um, we were supposed to be a number of things like build a school. So I went to the head man of the village, and so I was now under his protection, and said, you know, let's build a school. And uh, I said, I know you want your young people to be educated. He said, nah, we need a mosque. <laughs> so for six months, we went back and forth about this mosque. And of course, I had these very smart Peace Corps friends with me, and we were debating church and state during that six months. Were we allowed to build mosques? <laughs> we were government employees. Um, and finally, one of the Peace Corps volunteers said, no one even knows where we are. The Peace Corps can't even get in touch with us. Let's build the darn mosque. So we went and built the mosque. We got the mosque finished. We had a dedication of the mosque. And the sheikh of the village turned to me and said, I think we need a school. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so patience. Patience to do yeah, this. Yeah, patience and listening to people. And that's how you raise money, actually. You listen to people. You listen to people and then shape it in some way. And I just think leaders are made. And there are certain kinds of personalities that lend themselves to this. Um, you cannot be a controlling personality and run a major research university in this country because you're not in control. And if you want to keep yourself up at night, um, you, just, you just can't do it. You just have to assume. It's not going with the flow because you want to lead, but it's, it's a, different, a, a different feel. Let's talk a little bit about research universities, because as a dean of a medical school, my, the worry that I all at night I worry about now I'm worrying every now every day that someone's doing stupid some, something yeah. stupid right now you you taught me that I think I do know that but now I actually can put it in verbal uh, we'll be able to say that at meetings I know someone's doing something stupid now um, but I worry at night that with all the pressures you know be accountable. Uh, the fact that we aren't getting as much money for our services, that we're going to forget to be innovative. And 10 years from now, they're going to say, where were they? Why weren't they thinking? And how do we keep that going during these times where it seems the toughest? Well, you know, it's, uh, one of the things is we have to communicate with the public very clearly about who we are and what it costs to be what we are because um, we have to compete on a daily basis with community hospitals, with community docs, with people that don't have the burden of training and of research. And so we have a set of faculty that are more expensive because they're training, they're educating students, and, um, and they're doing research. And the NIH, with all due respect, is not paying us for that research. We've got to raise money to offset uh, the costs that they're not covering. And I can't tell you how many battles I had with OMB about overhead. They said I had a self-interest. Laura Tyson up there. Let me say something about someone like Laura Tyson. In the White House were Larry Summers and Laura Tyson, who were the only other two people in the whole administration that understood research universities. And they were enormously helpful in translating both the politics uh, within the White House, but also the wider politics about the importance of it. I worry about exactly what you worry about. We're more expensive, and it, it's not just how we deliver the care. It's the quality of people that are delivering the care and the fact that they're involved in discovery. Discovery takes money. And if we lose that genius, that particular, we've developed these research universities. You go to other parts of the world, their research institutes 
are outside of their universities. They're not inside their universities. In Greece, are they inside the universities? They're outside in institutes, right? See, I knew she was Greek. Yeah. <laughs> Tell the kinsman any place. Um, but, um, and, and so we've got to be able to explain that we create new knowledge. And we're taking our science right to the bedside. That people want to go to the great academic health centers because they know we're on the cutting edge. The problem is they really only want to go to us when they're in real trouble. And we need them all the way through a seamless system. Um, but we've got to make the case over and over again. Um, and we need to understand. I had a great debate with Bill Clinton about who was going to be the head of the National Institutes of Health. I wanted a bench scientist because I thought it was time that we had a bench scientist who understood the clinical part. And he said, no one ever heard of Har Harold Valmas. And I said, well, he has a Nobel Prize. And he said, no one ever heard of this guy. I said, trust me, please, Mr. President. We've got to have this person because he could really lead us into a golden age of biomedical research. And finally, the president relented because I wouldn't relent. So <laughs> he relented. And, um, but I did something else. I called all of my friends around the country uh, at the research universities, and I said, the day the president announces Varmus, I want you all to call the White House and say what a brilliant <laughs> appointment it was. <laughs> and so the next, the next week I saw the president, he said, boy, you were absolutely right. My friends called the <laughs> I think that sort of defines her unflappable, but scheduled, right, to do it is, so what can I do you to make it? You don't quite say no to the president, but you keep the conversation going. Right, to do it, and, and load your own gun. I, I think that's really great to do it. So I was just at the White House this week, which was my first time ever being called and summons to talk about climate change and health. And it was a great summit. Uh, there are about 30 of us there, and we're just developing a school of population and global health. And many school of nursing deans were there, many school of public health and medical schools. And we were called because we are in the middle of climate change here. You know, water is priceless. And Absolutely. We have increased heat, but we also have agriculture and veterinary schools. And actually, the research that we have done here for years is the reason I was called. I was just the representative. I had to do a lot of debriefing over the yeah. last week as a vascular surgeon, but a lot of climate change is resulting not only in asthma and air pollution, but cardiovascular disease exactly. and looking at different ways to do that. So how, how do we approach that? We're going to have two years now, so actually it'll probably butt up right to the change of this where we're going to be involved in summits, and I'm delighted that we're going to be involved to get people to change because part of it is eat less red meat, exercise, simple things for people to and do. And don't smoke. And don't smoke to make that happen. Yeah, and and to the climate look at change that. issue, of course, is quite dramatic. I was on that panel on risky business. And heat alone, um, in terms of older people and the impact it has, as well as cold, I mean, mm -hmm. both of them, but heat in particular yeah, the number, of, the number of deaths they predicted from heat was exactly. unbelievable. And so remember the Chicago heat um, uh, where they didn't have enough air conditioning. My part of the country is sort of used to the heat and organized um, uh, probably a little better for the heat because we get it every year and it's not, us too. Um, it's not unusual for us. But to the extent that we can link these things to human health, to individual experience, to tell stories about what the impact are, we've just got to go out and explain ourselves better. Um, it doesn't it doesn't do us much good to just explain the science. We have to explain the impact of the science on our lives, on our kids' lives, and on their futures. Well, maybe they will invite me back, because that's what I said. I said the 484-page thing you gave me to read was really good. Yeah. I read... 10 pages of it. Um, but nobody in the public sector is going to read that. And even physicians and students won't. Um, I suggested social media to actually yeah, say what, what's in it for your kid. And, and if you make it too big, that it, the whole world's going to end tomorrow and there's going to be insects and, and, and hail and all that, people mm -hmm. will run. And if you don't make it personal, they don't exactly. think they have to try. And there are local leaders. This is not something that can just be done from the top down. The mayor of Miami Beach, Phil Levine, who's a really neat guy, has taken on the issue. He read all the stuff about what was going to happen to Miami Beach, and he's just taken on the issue and talked the people of his city into making real investments in infrastructure. Um, and so we need leaders at every level that see the human impact 
of some of these huge issues like climate change. Um, well, I think that's society. why also there was a huge group of deans of school of nursing. I'm not saying that just for my friend Martha, who's in the front uh, row, but there's no question that nursing has made a big impact. You've had a little experience with that, writing about it. Maybe you want to chat about it. Martha taught me about nursing at Hopkins, right. and, and certainly the school of nursing deans actually had a lot more to say about community service. Heather Young does that here when you look at where they're deployed and what they do. Role of nursing in all of this, and I actually think that um, I chaired the Institute of Medicine report on the future of nursing. Um, they sort of twisted my arm. They wanted a non-nurse to do it. I really learned a lot. I thought I I have been through three different schools with three different nursing deans. I thought I knew a lot about nursing until I did that report. But um, we actually are going into the golden age of nursing. We've got to do something about these scope of practice rules. With all due respect, I the, want them the to medical help. leaders. I want them to help. The There's medical not, leaders in never this be state of and us. others uh, just have to expand the scope of practice. We're training nurses up to here and then limiting what they can do down to here. You're paying for that. Those are taxpayers that are are paying for that that silliness. We need a seamless healthcare system in it, which everybody practices up to their training. And um, and that's the only way we're going to have world-class health at an affordable price for everyone uh, in this country. And nursing in particular, which is so patient-centered, both in their research as well as in um, their understanding of the delivery system, it's more than just managing chronic disease and um, uh, the person that runs the University of Miami Hospital is a nurse. Absolutely. Got his uh, doctorate in nursing practice. And so I'm a big fan of nursing, and I'm a big fan of the partnership uh, between physicians and nurses and physicians' assistants and pharmacists. I often, I have to still learn about the healthcare system. So I'll sit outside uh, the pharmacist's office on the chairs that... Uh, uh, the older people sit on. <laughs> um, but I'll get up if someone comes along that needs my seat. But I just sit and watch um, the interaction between the pharmacists and the patients and how confused the patient always is when they come in, and particularly if they're older and they're not using the Internet for their second opinion, and how much patience the, pharmac <laughs> and how much patience the pharmacist uh, has to explain things and take the time and call a doctor if they think something doesn't seem right in terms of medicines crossing. I just, they've, we've got to see every part of the healthcare system in a partnership, in a team approach, and it can't be hierarchical anymore, I think. Absolutely. It really has to be a team approach, and I know that you get it, and, um, and your chancellor uh, gets it, but this is, this is the world that we're going into, and Unfortunately, the states determine what nurses can do. They determine what doctors can do, too. It's called scope of practice. It's the limitations, and often the medical societies have limited that, um, and um, they've just got to get over it and let people practice up to their training. And that includes physicians. Absolutely. Because there are restraints on some physicians as well. Um, but, but to get a standard of practice, to get high-quality health care in this country, everybody's going to have to be part of the team. Yeah, the person that Did I missed I say the enough? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the person I missed the most from Hopkins, not only Martha, um, was the PA I practiced with. Holly yeah. and I, we practiced. She got out of our PA residency. Her and I managed my patients. She went to the operating room with me, and she would sit and talk to them. Pretty soon the patients learned she was better than me because she had more patients, as in CE, yeah. and she was kinder, and she wasn't in a hurry, and that they knew she had access to me, that if it was something that she would do it, so I miss her. And we're, the way we're training our students now is all the interdisciplinary, and then the pharmacists yeah. making rounds as well as the... Respect, nurses. respect, oh, respect big. for the other parts of the, of, the professional, of the professions, because we're really all in this together at the end of the day. And there's not enough of MAOs to yeah. do that. So maybe I'm going to ask her one more question, and then we'd like all of you to ask some questions, too. They're going to, I think the mics are on either side. Is that where we're going to leave them, I think? I actually or... read the entire Obamacare Act, if anyone has a question. <laughs> all 10,078 pages. Now, do... let me tell you why I did it, because I knew someday someone was going to ask me whether I read it. It was, you know, it was a dumb reading, because it's all an adjustment on some other part of the legislation. But I actually went through every page. Yeah. Well, as a surgeon, what I did is I assigned it to two of my chief residents, and I made, <laughs> I made them read it and then totally I made cool. and then I made him debate it yeah. and tell me what page they were talking from so <laughs> sort of by default I read it to do that yep. 
So um, the campaign, I'll ask you one more question about it, then we'll have some of our audience ask you a question. Uh, as um, Hillary, we assume she's going to announce she's going to run, and, and when you look at that campaign compared to her previous one, if you could give her three points of advice about her campaign, which I think you might do, <laughs> no, no. if I were to guess. What would you tell her that I, I'd just be give different? her one piece of advice, and that is you can't run on your resume. Yes. You have to run on the future. Yeah. And I think she already got that advice. I mean, I think um, that there's a kind of consistency on that. Um, I can't run on my resume. I mean, I just, it, it, it's too long for one thing. But, um, but we all have to run on our ideas for the future and on what we're going to do out there next, uh, not on what we've done in the past. The past informs us, but it really is what's the world going to look like? For those of us in higher education, I say to parents, hey, guess what? I don't know what they're going to need to know 10 years from now. But I do know the skills they need so they can absorb history and new technology and, and have context for what they're going to learn. What you're teaching your students now will probably be out of date, five years. Well, some say two. I yeah, mean, they, they and do. so um, you've got to teach them how to absorb uh, new knowledge. Clinton actually came to my class one day. He sort of dropped in. Um, and she teaches a class. Tell them what you teach. I teach the politics and economics of healthcare, and I three hundred students. Three hundred students. Three hundred students and me. No auditors. No other faculty. Just me and the kids. And so Clinton uh, called one day. He was coming through from Haiti, and um, he wa actually wanted me to play golf, but I wasn't available. So I was teaching my class. He said, "Oh, what, what are you teaching this week?" He, I said, "Medicare." He said, "Oh, I know about that." I said, "I know you do." <laughs> I said, "Why don't you come by?" So he. I sort of, it was President's Day, and I said to the students halfway into the class when I saw the signal at the door, I said, you must be pretty bored. You want to know what it's like to explain to 20-year-olds about Medicare? <laughs> Their eyes were glazing over. I said, oh, maybe we can make this more lively. What day is today? And they said, it's President's Day. Why are we in class? I said, so you can listen to a president in Wux Clinton. Ah! But what I, what was important was not what he said about health care. He's obviously, he knows more than I do about health care. But what he said at the end, when a student said to him, um, if I want to run for president, what is it I need to know? And he said, you have to be a sponge. He said, I'm still learning. I'm still reading a couple of books a week. I'm still talking to smart people. I'm learning subjects I didn't study at Georgetown. He said, you just have to know lots of different things, and you've got to know them in depth. So you've just got to keep learning. Don't think just because you got out of a great university that you've learned enough. And what's better advice for the future than be a sponge? Absolutely. So maybe I can invite anyone that'd like to come to the mic to ask a question. I do know about Medicare, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Why don't you introduce yourself and then ask your question? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm Mike Chapman. I guess this isn't on. Is it on? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm Mike Chapman. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and a traumatologist. And uh, we really appreciate your bringing this topic to our attention. Um, it's been a wonderful discussion, and I have a question for you. Uh, it's my understanding that in the last decade, the primary cause of death in the developing world has become trauma. It's the number one cause between the age of 15 and 45, mm -hmm. and it's devastating their productive population. Mm -hmm. It was featured this week on, on, on public television, and they uh, did a little special on Vietnam, and as Vietnam has developed its middle class, everybody's buying motorcycles. Mm -hmm. Without but helmets. No helmets. You may have seen that program. So they're, they're being devastated with trauma. Uh, could you comment on that particular yeah, problem um, in the developing world? I know world? a couple of things. Actually, when I went to Vietnam, we had a health attache, uh, which was actually paid for by the Rockefeller Foundation at the embassy. And we had an ambassador there who rode around on a motorcycle. Clinton saw a picture of him without a helmet. So he, he called me over the White House and said, give him this helmet. I want him to have a helmet on. It's bad news to have an ambassador that's not wearing a helmet in Vietnam. So I took the helmet to, to the ambassador. Um, it is true that trauma is a big issue, particularly among young people. If you look at the Russian statistics, it's drownings. Think of the number of lakes and rivers that Russia has. And they don't, uh, they don't have lifeguards. <laughs> So they lose a population between 9 and 15 in big numbers. So when you talk about trauma, you're talking about automobile accidents, motorcycles, swimming, 
uh, depending on what the terrain is like um, in, in many of these countries. So I'm not surprised. I'm not sure the numbers are that big, but maybe cumulatively. But country by country, I can think of uh, strategies that we worked on on accidents in particular that could be preventable accidents, which is an important issue. And we work with the Russians very carefully to reduce, to put up signage, for example, and dangerous rivers and, and lakes. You'll be amazed what the simplest kind of low cost uh, things will do. I just, I, we've got to get people off of just thinking about high tech all the time, thinking about some common sense approaches um, to reducing uh, things like, um, like trauma, of course. And there is not a world of orthopods um, in many of, uh, in many of these uh, countries, but uh, you're absolutely right, it's a serious problem. Well, I know when I was in Kenya, too, there was a transport problem. They'd be out on these smaller roads and have that, and there was no triage to even get yeah. them to where they needed to get to, and, and having some ability to get the triage and also preventative, but once it happens, yeah. to transport them. I spent them. much of my Peace Corps uh, life riding around in those jitneys with the goats and the... That was fun. Okay. I recommend the Peace Corps to anyone. Yeah. Another question. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I'm Ken Verisub. I teach in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Mm -hmm. And to, to what extent is this epidemic of non-communicable disease, growing epidemic of non-communicable diseases in developed countries, actually responsibility of the United States through tax breaks to countries doing business, to, to companies doing business overseas, farm subsidies, not inform, forcing laws for environmental pollution that we would do here? And what do we do about it? Well, we've done a lot already in terms of the U.S. Uh, responsibility. Uh, we've done a lot on tobacco in terms of our own negotiations uh, um, on tobacco with our trade uh, representatives. Uh, we've absolutely flipped our position um, on tobacco where we're no longer protective and offering access uh, uh, to tobacco, but you're absolutely right. We've got to align our public policies uh, with uh, our health policies in a very direct way. And I think we're being far more careful in putting things through a sieve. One of the important things about having the environmental group right in the White House is because they interact with the National Security Council. We now have a group at the National Security Council, which I actually helped do years ago, um, a, a health group, a bunch of uh, public health docs and environmental people that actually put a lot of these policies uh, through a filter as we're taking positions on them. Thank you. Great. Other question? Go ahead. Uh, Steve Russo, University of California, Merced, uh, the Blum Center for Developing Economies. I, I loved your examples of how we, we, we can push things to other poor countries, uh, and that, that's something that's going to continue going as we're, we're global. Um, it, can you offer some comments about income inequality, workforce development, and health, and really focusing on how do we use income uh, strategies as a way to improve the health of communities? Uh, yeah, are you talking about the U.S. or abroad? I would say both at right, this both. point. Um, well, I, uh, there are people in this room that know more about workforce development. I think we did a chapter of it in our nursing, uh, uh, in our nursing uh, a book. Uh, my own view on uh, workforce development is, again, has to do with scope of practice. We just have to think about health and the health delivery system in more imaginative ways. In my community uh, of Miami, we have a Haitian population with a high incidence of cervical cancer. And to reach that population, you can't coax them into hospitals or clinics. We developed a self-test using outreach workers from the community. Now, that's a technique that we've used all over the world in, in different, uh, to deliver uh, TB drugs, for example, and other kinds of things. And what it's taught me is the kind of infrastructure for healthcare delivery, particularly as we manage multicultural committees, communities, uh, needs to be different from what we've done before. And when we think about workforce development, it's not just the highly trained nurses and doctors. Um, it's people that are well-trained, that are certified to do different parts of the delivery system. But the key to it is the integration and the use of technology to make sure we get feedback. The surgeon needs to know a lot about that patient. 
And if we're using different delivery systems and workforce in different ways, she needs that information um, for her patients. So um, I think there's a lot more to be done and a lot more investments we have to make, a lot more creative thinking well, in healthcare. I and I, one of the advantages of being a Peace Corps volunteer is that you just, I recommend it to all of my students, you look at the world differently. You respect people that work differently. You're, you become a citizen of the world. You know what poverty smells like. Yeah. It's not that you can't be in your own community and see poverty, but it's just, it just puts you in a different position. Even 50 years later, I was a Peace Corps volunteer 50 years ago. 50 years later, I still remember those experiences. There was a technology that Tom Nesbitt, one of my uh, vice chancellors, was telling me about last week that a small company is doing to put a little chip in every pill. Sounds expensive, but it's not. It's sort of like a little layer. So the people know they took the pill. It actually, when they swallow it in their stomach, the two little wires hit. It gets registered in the, their app or their computer. So I know as the doctor they took their pill and that everyone knows that they took those expensive I need Hep that for C my drugs. aspirin because half the time I can't remember whether well, I took the and aspirin I was in the morning say, or not. It was for all of us who don't remember if I took my aspirin yeah, and things right. too where I go, did I take that last night? And it actually will register it so that you know when you give expensive TB drugs or Hep C drugs, they actually take it. Their office is right next to a great big company that can help us do this, and it would layer it on to help us all know they're doing what you said. Even in our clinical trials, if you test two different things, how do you know they took it? And this is amazing. It was some young person that mm -hmm. said, well, you can do this, you know, to make it Well, happen. you know, in TB, in, um, we just stood there while they took the pills. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. And now if we can do that virtually, it's really nice. Yep. So Satya, yep. introduce yes. yourself. Uh, this is Satya Dandekar. I'm in medical microbiology and immunology, and thank you very much for your presentations, and we learned a lot, really thought-provoking. Uh, I would like to sort of make comment on infectious diseases, and we are talking about um, maybe non-infectious disease-related uh, morbidities here. Mm -hmm. uh, but infectious diseases have played a big role in cancer, and you uh, mentioned about hepatitis B virus, right. and now liver cancer rates have gone down, and papilloma virus and cervical cancer is being prevented. Uh, I think it's about uh, the persistent uh, subclinical viral infections that we control and deal with and our gut microbiota, a lot of them may be altered because of our changing habits of diet. So environmental exposures and the epigenetic changes which take place uh, may drive a lot of those changes towards cancer or cardiovascular disease. So this may be at the bottom of it. So they almost may serve as uh, the role of a canary in a coal mine. So, uh, some of these markers actually should be integrated in studying these kind of... It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, a disorders. very interesting comment. Yeah. That's a very well, good... I actually spent um, a few hours with... Uh, she's chair of the department, yeah. uh, at, with her department a couple weeks ago, and they've done symposiums and, mm -hmm. and have telling me about that. And one of the reasons I got invited to the White House was stuff that your uh, department did and looking at those interactions as we go forward. It's just... Uh, and as we move towards personalized medicine, that kind of information will become very important as we integrate and target yes, our absolutely. treatments much more uh, directly. My degree is in political science, but I thought that was a really, I understood the statement. Mm. Next question. Mark Schenker, Associate Vice Provost for Outreach and Engagement and in the School of Medicine here. Um, the United States clearly has a number one research uh, universities, but some people feel that we're not as good in translating our findings, our discovery into uh, ways of actually improving society. Uh, do you, and, and we don't have reward system for that within the institution. We reward discovery. Um, do you agree with that, and do you have any thoughts about it? <laughs> well, I think we're getting better. We're getting better at that. When I was at Wisconsin, which had this very famous research foundation, WARF, um, which um, um, took the scientists' work and just ran with it, basically. Got it licensed and everything else. 
uh, we developed a system. The dean of the graduate school came up with this really neat idea. He sent a letter to the homes of all the scientists and said, if you'll just fill out the form and tell us what you're working on, you don't have to tell us what the implications are or anything else. We'll give you $1,000. And it, we sent it to their homes <laughs> so that the rest of the family would see that they could get $1,000 <laughs> for, for just filling out a simple form. And we picked up all sorts of things uh, out of that. But to expect people who have spent their lives on the bench to actually think, and particularly in basic science, to think ahead about the implications may not be as good as having a whole bunch of people that know how to run with some of that and, and, and making sure that people are having conversations. I love the new labs where people have to share equipment and talk to each other. And so um, we're getting better at taking work uh, from the bench to the, uh, but there are all sorts of ethical barriers in between. We can't do our own clinical testing and, and, and other kinds of things, but I think we are getting better. But I also think we can't expect people that are trained this way to be able to explain what the implications are out there. So we have to think about some incentives and some ways to find that out and to run with it. Publishing is part of it. As, uh, as people publish basic science in journals, other people see it and say, hey, maybe I can use that uh, in some way. So I, um, we're not perfect in research universities, but everybody has their role. So I'm very careful about saying that everyone that's doing science needs to tell us precisely how practical it's going to be at the end. It's very dangerous, whether it's presidents or governors trying to explain to them why we have research universities. What we're doing is anticipating the future. That's what discovery is about. And everybody ought to be playing uh, their role along the way. Go ahead. Hi. Um, my name is Lauren James. I'm a community college student. I was wondering if it's OK if I could ask you two questions? Sure. OK. So the first. If you're from a community college, you could ask me five. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of community colleges. Um, yeah. uh, so the first one was one that my mom wanted to ask. She's an ER director up at Clear Lake. Mm -hmm. um, she wanted to ask what you thought the future of hospitals was going to be like, like what the future, the hospital of the future would look like, I guess. Oh, boy. Uh, you could probably answer that question better than I can. It's going to be a different kind of hospital. We're going uh, to have uh, great big ones, and then I think we'll have less small ones out there. It'll mm -hmm. be more in your homes. And I think we'll have more home care. I think a lot of home care and ability for you, especially you, um, <laughs> to get on an app, figure out things, use telehealth and telemedicine to talk to me mm -hmm. and deliver with nurse practitioners and PAs in your home. I but think. tell your mom that we're going to need ERs. Yes. Because <laughs> no when matter it where we go put well. them, she's going to have a job. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and probably I'll... the outposts out there would be little emergency outposts where they, people would come and stabilize, get, be stabilized, and then, and then be transferred. Transported. Okay. And then uh, my second question was, since I am a college student, I have a lot of life ahead of me, but um, how do you think I could make more of an impact in developing countries that like, has to do with healthcare, I guess? Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> well, you can prepare yourself for that. What do, you, uh, what, do you, what do you have a passion for at your community college? Um, I really enjoy art in general. I mean, my mom's been an ER nurse for all like my entire life so mm -hmm. she's been a really big influence on me but I'm incredibly squeamish so I probably <laughs> wouldn't be able to do anything with a knife um, but but I you want to help uh, you want to help people in other countries yeah well I've... you know one of the great professions is art therapy yeah. um, uh, art therapy using art mm -hmm. uh, to help people uh, is a very important profession so you might think about that. But you know, whatever you decide to pursue, you can still help people in other parts of the world. You can help them on short-term trips. Almost all the churches run something short-term. There are mm -hmm. lots of programs where you could make a direct contribution. When you get rich and famous, you can <laughs> donate money to a nonprofit organization. But don't think of your life as spending full time doing that, but as part of being a good citizen. Okay. Let's give this young woman a big hand. It <laughs> takes a lot of nerve to get up when you're Thank a community you. college student. Uh, my name is Eli Smith, and I'm a community college student as well, Good. studying <laughs> political science. And my question is, um, what do you think the best way to convince people that immunization is the right way to go? Because it's not only people who can't afford it, 
that aren't getting their kids immunized. It's also very educated people. Oh, no, and, it's mostly educated people. Yeah. It's not people that can't afford it. Um, yeah. People that can't afford it get it and exactly. understand they have to protect their children. Uh, there's an ideology out there that, uh, uh, that immunizations, no matter, it's an anti-science movement. When you get to right to the fundamentals, it's anti-science. They don't believe, or they believe that immunizations cause some something else like autism, which no one has been able to prove. Every national academy has studied that, and no one's been able to um, uh, to prove that. And none of us would recommend it if we thought there was any uh, risk. I think that we have to just keep telling stories to people, what the implications of are for them not to protect their children. We have to appeal to their better angels in terms of protecting their children. They're not protecting themselves, they're protecting their children. This is about their kids. And whatever their ideology is, whatever their political persuasion is, we all have a responsibility to protect the kids. They also have a responsibility to protect the kids in their community. They have no right to infect a kid who can't be immunized because they've got some kind of autoimmune um, system problem. They have no right to put any child in their community at risk. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Great, great. Give this young man a hand. I love these community college students. Another question? Are we doing it? I think we're doing good to do it. Okay. Uh, my name is David Shearing. I am a farmer. I grow walnuts and almonds. The uh, nut industry funds a huge amount of health research, uh, whether it's almonds or walnuts or peanuts or the pecans. Uh, do you want to comment on the dangers of... Uh, industry-supported research, health research? You know, um, I, I'm not as uptight about it if we have the proper ethical controls um, and if we disclose. Uh, we've got to be very public and very transparent about who's paying for the research. And our researchers have to be very careful as they're taking industry money. But, um, I mean, I rode by the Mondavi wine. I happen to know the uh, Mondavis. I know the nut people, too, by the way. Um, <laughs> because How many um, nut people do you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know the California nut people. In fact, the one thing I miss is that every year the California nut people would come visit the Secretary of Health and Human Services. I got the best nuts. Yeah. Um, and I could take them because they were under $25. And <laughs> um, anything, uh, the rule was anything you could eat. <laughs> yeah, anything you could eat, yeah. Um, but um, I think, I, I, look, Congress has to make up its mind. First, it, it, it urges us to work with industry. Then it changes its mind. The fact is, this fragile empire we have put together, we've put together with a multinational pharmaceutical industry as part of it. We don't do every part in research universities of the research. They take our, our basic science research, they, take some of, uh, they finance some of the clinical trials uh, that we're doing. The most important thing for the public is that we're highly ethical and we're transparent and that our work is reviewed by others. So um, it, uh, when I was chancellor at Wisconsin, we took money from the cranberry industry. I used to go out in the bogs um, and um, they actually endowed a cranberry chair. But <laughs> it was important, and we studied mushrooms and other things. I don't think we had any nuts in Wisconsin. Well, we had real nuts, oh, but yes, not, they're, they're, yeah, they're not were, edible nuts. I lived in Wisconsin yeah, for six right. years. There's some nuts. Um, but, uh, uh, the, but everybody had to be careful. But for great research universities, particularly that have an agriculture uh, department and, and schools, They've got to do, the land grant was funded to do research that would be applicable to the economy of, um, of their states and of their communities. That's what the great land grant universities were about. And we had a college of agriculture at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and they were doing research on milk, I mean, on all the great industries of Wisconsin, some of it funded by the industries themselves. And we had to be transparent and ethical and very open about what we were doing and making sure there was outside reviews of what we were doing. So um, I, just, uh, I just don't get myself twisted in a pretzel about uh, these kinds of things if you do them right. 
Well, I think we actually need industry now, too, because of the NIH and the fact that the every, decline dollar, in funding. And yeah. every dollar we have, we need another dollar to do it. And actually, industry may actually let you get to an answer quicker sometimes because of your ability to do exactly the way you want to do it. I'm Mary Lou de Leon Science. I'm a professor of nursing. I want to thank you for the leadership you've brought forward in the, in the IOM report. But um, as a Latina nurse researcher here, um, we have a lot of concerns over health disparities in multicultural populations. So you've mentioned, you know, some possibilities that are occurring with global um, and prevention of global disease and chronic. What's the next frontier? How do you think we're going to be able to tackle and overcome and eliminate these disparities in our time? Well, we have to focus on the disparities. We have to understand them in the populations that we're dealing with. Um, I gave you a description of our, our work with Haitian women, but we're also working uh, with the Hispanic population of Miami on AIDS. And you probably know Nana Paragallo, my dean, who um, is one of the world's experts on Hispanics and, and HIV. Um, but uh, we have to understand the disparities for each of the populations and cr try to close those disparities. Uh, David Satcher, when he was Surgeon General, did precisely um, that. He identified the disparities by ethnic group. And um, we have to design and continue to design strategies that reduce uh, those disparities. And that requires cultural understanding. This business about some of the governors around the country saying we don't need anthropology um, or sociology or uh, we, you have to understand the populations that you're del delivering to. I mean, my students said last week, because we were doing an international health care, how come the Norwegians have such great outcomes? I said, because they're all Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Yes. It's so easy when you've got one ethnic group, one population. And when I've done research in the VA system, too, you know, they all believe in that one system. So they come, they'll go on the trials, they come back, they think that's what they do, and you get gold here because they're all veterans. You know, they will mm -hmm. come and make that happen. Uh, so having everybody be under their own umbrella improves it. Hi, my name is Zandra Ballard, and I have a daughter uh, getting ready to graduate from Cornell next month in uh, global health. Oh, wow. And a uh, son here who's studying uh, environmental science. What are the career uh, objections and opportunities for them? In global health? Mm -hmm. Oh, and there are a lot of science. career uh, patterns in global health. Uh, most people I know in global health went on to get an MPH, actually got a terminal uh, master's degrees. But there are a slew of international organizations and non-governmental organizations that are looking for talented people uh, in global health. Uh, and most of the work around the world is going on. Um, if she's just graduating, she ought to be looking at save the children and care and um, uh, probably not USAID because they do a lot of contracting um, out. But there are, there are numerous organizations that are working uh, in global health. Her department at uh, Cornell ought to have, ought to be placing people immediately in internships so that they can move on in their careers. Tell her to join the Peace Corps. She really <laughs> wants to do global health. Tell her to join the Peace Corps. That's great. Well, this has been wonderful, uh, stimulating. I guess the only last question I have is, why don't you run for president? Yeah. <laughs> you make sense. You're unflappable, yeah. and you make sense. I don't like working weekends. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we can't thank you enough um, for joining us today. Our, our next step uh, is to exit. Those curtains are going to open up, I'm told, uh, for us to go enjoy some wine since we actually make it and get degrees yeah. in it and do that. And uh, Chancellor Katehi and Provost Hexter and, and the rest of the faculty and um, students and, and public persons. Oh, that's that pretty are, cool. In our community college. Yes, isn't it amazing? We just can't thank you enough for being uh, honest and, and uh, forthright and giving us things to think about today as we go forward to do great things. And we appreciate you taking time on your tour out here to see us. And we wish you great luck uh, with that. If it doesn't turn out with the Clintons, you can always come back and we'll find something for you to do here with us. <laughs>